Hey everybody, welcome to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm so excited to be here. I'm honored, I'm grateful. Don't forget to click thumbs up. That's how you can help me out with this video right here. Click thumbs up on this video, subscribe to my YouTube page and share it with your friends. That helps out the podcast, allows me to do a little bit more work around the studio and get some fun guests on the episodes coming up. And also don't forget you can call the podcast. 513-916-0930. Give us a call. Leave a voicemail. We'll play it on the podcast. You can ask a question, offer a suggestion, and ask for advice. However you want to use that time, we will charge you a quarter. We won't. It's a free call. And also, don't forget, I'm on tour. That's right. jessiemay.com forward slash tour. Your girl is out and about. I just got back from La Jolla. La Jolla, California, but I will be making stops in Brea Improv October 18th for one night only at 10.30, I believe the show is, as well as Rochester, New York at Comedy on the Carlson. That's going to be the weekend before Halloween. I'm going to be in Las Vegas, Omaha, Nebraska, Syracuse, New York, Springfield, Massachusetts. We just added North Carolina. I'm also going to be in Boston, Massachusetts, jessiemay.com for tour tickets don't forget to check that out and also check out my merch and however you support me if you buy a ticket if you buy a merch a portion of that will go towards the alzheimer's association and hilarity for charity both amazing causes that help those suffering with the disease and those taking care of their loved ones suffering with the disease and also don't forget that you can subscribe to my patreon page to get the full video all of me. You get all of me. I'm giving you all of me. Subscribe to the Patreon page. It's a fun page. It's a fan page. And that is available for you. And what else? Did I forget anything? No. Let's just get into the fun. Let's get into the freaking episode. It is Halloween season. I love Halloween season. It's one of my favorite times of year. It makes me feel nostalgic because it was such a big time for me as a child to go out and dress up like a ghoul and a goblin. I will be doing a special Halloween episode the week of Halloween, and each week I'm going to give you my list of my top horror movies that will be in the description of each episode for this month starting now. So I hope that you are excited about that, are as excited about it as I am. I'm drinking out of my Halloween mug that my assistant Deb, I believe she got this at Marshall's. Never can not find something at Marshall's. There's always something available for everyone in your life and even people who are no longer in your life. Let's let's normalize buying gifts for people you no longer talk to. Hey, bud, miss ya. Here's a miss you gift. Miss you not so much. You're welcome. Thank you next. Marshall's is great for all of that. I uh, am drinking a little coconut water to stay hydrated. It is called Original CO2. You know, I like to let you know my deliciousness that I enjoy in my life. They are not a sponsor, but they're so good. It's, I think you can find it like at rest stops, gas stations. It's kind of all over the place. There's chunks of coconut in it. And that might gross some of you out. Kind of like pineapple on a pizza. I don't get it. I know there's a lot of people. I feel like a lot of Hawaiians that are yelling. And a lot of people who are also gross yelling. Not that Hawaiian people are gross. I'm just saying people who like pineapple on pizza are gross. This is probably going to be a real room divider, but I'm going out and I'm saying it. I'm edgy. No pineapple on pizza. So I'm excited to have my Halloween mug. I'm excited that it's filled with CO2, coconut water. And I'm going to tell you something that was horrifying, horrifying that I found on my dog's bed. You're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe what I found on my dog's bed. That's going to be at the end of the episode. I'm still having nightmares about it. Before we get too deep, Mm. Don't even say that's what she said. I can't stand it. I read, for the first time, Stephen King's Salem's Lot. I'm a big fan of Stephen King. I've read a lot of his books. I've read his books on writing, even Dance Macabre, I believe it's called, which is a book about horror and writing horror. There's so many books of his that I love, and I never read Salem's Lot before. Fun story, Salem's Lot is short for Jerusalem's Lot based on our real town in uh, New England, which most of his stories include that. And a lot of his stories include authors within the story he's telling. So it's somewhat autobiographical in the sense I feel like he throws his essence in there. Anyways, read this book for the holiday season. That's right. Halloween is a holiday. Confirm or deny. I confirm. And this was delightful. A page turner, really scary, so well written. There's just some paragraphs where you're like, gosh, darn it. 
Stephen King is so good. L- look at this. I won't. I won't go through the entire book because I realize that <laughs> you guys didn't come here to have me <laughs> read to you. But let me just read you one sentence. The wind makes you ache in some place that is deeper than your bones. It may be that it touches something old in the human soul, a chord of race memory that says, migrate or die, migrate or die. That's what happens. We have to migrate or die. Isn't that wild? Because I tell you guys, movement is the antidote to anxiety, antidote to depression. So Stephen King and I are on the same wavelength. Go out, pick up this book. It's an older book. It's from my mom's house, and this is one of the many things I grabbed from that house before we sold it. Oh, gosh, darn it. What a heartache. Before we sold it, I did grab a pile of her books, and I thought, oh, this holiday season, I'm going to read some scurry books. So I read Sam's Lot because I knew that they had redone, per se, the movie. There's a movie uh, that was released, I think, like in the late 70s. 79 for Warner Brothers, made for TV, I believe. And it's like a three-hour movie. I've never seen the original. I decided to read the book and then watch the new reboot. And I think it's streaming on Max. Who knows? Google it. You'll find it. I watched it. Guys, sometimes the book is just better. It's also a testament to your brain being better than your eyes. Sometimes our eyes lie, and sometimes our brain lies, too. Each one of those can tell a lie. You know, you look at something, you think someone's cute because you're caught up, and then you realize, what was I thinking? I feel like we should be like, what was I seeing? Because I saw someone cute. I thought I saw someone cute. So who am I really mad at, my eyes or my brain? How about both of those bandits? But when you read a book, it's usually better Because the mind's eye is beyond imaginative. It's beyond any imagination that can come to fruition on screen. I think that's why our dreams and when we're reading, what we're imagining is just so much better because of the magic that goes on inside of our skull. It's a mystery, but it's so beautiful. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to give this movie a shot. I I can't. I'm so mad. I'm so mad at the New Salem's Lot with all of the technology we have. All of the amazing actors that are dying to work. Talk about migrate or die. Most of them had to migrate out of L.A. or they were going to die because of how the industry has changed. A lot of these mofos are not working. They can't even get a Cialis commercial. You mean to tell me there's not one diabetes commercial I can get up on? That no one has warts anymore? (laughs) There's not one commercial for, for reading glasses you could just throw me. So, yeah, this movie was offensive in many different ways. It was offensive because the acting was subpar. Now, the one actor who's good is my friend, my new friend, John Hill. I did his show on Sirius XM, The John Hill Show. He's my new favorite person. He's so freaking funny and talented. We go back and forth about horror because we're both absolute fans. He's the one who told me to go see The Substance. And if you haven't seen The Substance, <laughs> girl, girl, if you haven't seen The Substance, let me tell you. And boy, any woman who is in the entertainment industry or any woman in general and any man who loves a woman in general should see this movie. It's jarring. But John Hill and I were going back and forth and he was talking about Salem's Lot. And he told me that the lead actor who plays Ben Mears, who's the main character in the book, is Bill Pullman's son. I love Bill Pullman. You know, they say a lot is genetic. Well, Bill Pullman's talented. Doesn't always permeate to the kid. Doesn't always mean that the child's going to be talented. And it's no, certainly if your parents are talented, it's no indicator that your kid's going to be. There's a lot of dumb kids out there. But I will say Bill Pullman's son is talented. He was also in that movie... Oh, gosh, what was that movie with that I I think I told you guys about, which should go on my list. I'm going to write it down. Skin Care with Elizabeth Banks. Bill Pullman's son plays the antagonist in that, I believe. Anyways, he's in this movie. He's he's got to carry the whole freaking film. Don't even get me started on the horrible New England accents. What are we doing? Why did we allow this to happen? The accents were horrible. The, the color of the film? Well, who did the colorization? You know, sometimes they like oversaturate 
the movie and the colors all off. I'm I'm trying to look up the 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 cast list because the accents were horrible. I I, I just can't. So Lewis Pullman, Mackenzie Lay, who was adorable, uh, Spencer Treat Clark, who's been in a lot of stuff. William Sadler, who's been around forever. Elfrey Woodward Woodard. I can never say your last name. Elfrey Woodard. Her New England accent. It deserves an award for worst New England accent I've ever heard. It's like Homegirl had never been to New England and watched the town on the plane and didn't even finish it. She watched the town on the flight to the set. It was like, okay, got it. Threw in a couple, park the car, and we got it. No, the New England accent, accents aren't an accent, they're, they're an essence. You know, like my accent... Here I am talking crap. My real accent is worse than Elfrey Woodard's fake New England accent. I'm well aware of that. But as a consumer, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed because you're taking a work of literature that is so damn good, for those of you who like the genre of horror, and you're going to crap all over it on the silver screen with all the access, all the resources we have. And I don't know who's responsible for the colorization, but it was like some sort of Pitbull music video. Why are, why is the colorization look like something from a Corona commercial? It's very romantic. Is this White Lotus 4? Everyone's doing that like White Lotus effect, that White Lotus filter. Just give me the real deal. This is a vampire movie. And don't even get me started on the... On, on, on the special effects with the freaking vamp. Don't get me started on the special effects with the freaking vamp. Because I'm going to be mad. I didn't know that we were going to go down this, this road of tearing apart whoever. Who, who, did, the, who did the movie? I, I, I need to call him. I, I need to know who directed this movie. Salem's on 2024. 20, I'll read you the breakdown because the book is great. Uh, author returns to the hometown of Jerusalem's lot in search of inspiration for his new book, only to discover that townspeople are being attacked by bloodthirsty vampires. Gary Doberman is who we have to be complaining about. Gary Doberman is the guy who's the problem. Apparently, he wrote the screenplay as well. Well, it, there was hardly any action. There was no buildup to the terror that Stephen King laid out for you. You've got a whole book as a reference. The whole book. Now, I will say if D David Doberman uh, has any upcoming films, I will be, uh, Gary Doberman has <laughs> any upcoming films, I am available. I probably blew it with my honesty, but that's what happens in this town. You're honest, you don't work as much. You play the game, you get jobs all the time. Well, I like to sleep at night and my mother raised me to have a little dignity. So I don't tread that line too often. I was disappointed. It took me three different sittings to finish this movie, as well as my friend John Hill. Very annoyed. Because that's minutes and time of my life. I'm not getting back. So to the New Salem's Lot, I say absolutely not. To the book, I say you got to read it. You have to read it. I'm going to give you a little weekend update. I was in La Jolla, California. Shout out to the comedy store for always taking care of me. That club is great. I love everybody working there. And I had such a great weekend. It was my first show for the kickoff of my fall tour. All my tickets are available on jessiemay.com right now. And a lot of special coincidences, a lot of serendipitous moments with my fans that came up to me and shared stories with me after the show. I always love when people do that. It makes me feel so much more connected to those who spend their money and energy to come out to see me perform. You know, I do some jokes about my mom and dad who are now dead, keeping up with the holiday, Halloween season theme, scary theme. I don't know where their ghosts are, even though I did see my mom in Italy waiting for my dad's ghost, even though I did hear the fart that one time with the fart machine. Beggars can't be choosers, but there were a couple people who came up to me after the show, and while I was on stage, actually, uh, this girl, I asked people, you know, anybody part of the Dead Moms Club, any part, anybody a part of the Dead Dads Club, and this one girl clapped because she was a part of both. And I was like, oh, girl, me too, we're orphans. I said, I loved my Nancy and Joe. And she goes, oh, my God, my parents' name were Nancy and Joe. 
And I thought, you know, this is how it works. If you allow it, if you allow yourself to get lost in the sauce. And when I'm saying sauce in this instance, I'm talking about the sauce, the magic, the mystery of existence, the magic of the universe, the what ifs after we die, what happens after we die, all of that. If we're not overly practical, which I can be sometimes, and if we're not too logical, we can get lost in the fact that there are coincidences that could be seen as signs. Now, I'm sure there's some people out there who have a Nancy and Joe for a mom and dad. They're common names, and there's a lot of people in the world. But the fact that she was sitting up front, she was blonde, she was fun and bubbly, and both of her parents shared my parents' name, it made me feel connected to my parents. It made me feel like this was a sign. And I think we all need signs. Signs that we're on the right path, signs that we're not forgotten, signs that we are still connected to those that are no longer with us, signs to keep going. A lot of us need signs to keep going. And so that really fueled me. It gave me this like burst of energy. And I was like, oh, Nancy and Joe, they're here and they're there for her. And it made me feel connected. And it was really great. And after the show, a couple people came up to me this one kid told me that he he also shares a birthday with my father because I talk about my dad's birthday. I was supposed to be born on my father's birthday. I've talked about this on the podcast. Had I been born on my dad's birthday, my sister, myself, and my father all would have had the same birthday. Is that a coincidence? Perhaps. Is it universal involvement and universal uh, connection? I choose to believe that. That's the type of person I am. I'm practical in some areas. In some areas, I like to be whimsical and feel and and use my heart and soul to be the thing that guides me. And so I thought that was really cool. I was like, oh man, that's sweet. I was like, you share a birthday with my dad. You were born on the same day as my dad, even though I could be your mom because he was like 19. Gosh, where does the time go? It goes nowhere. It's something we created. It's not real. We exist everywhere, everything all at once. There also was this really adorable mother and daughter duo that came out. And they came up to me after the show and they both were very emotional in a sweet way. And the mother told me how her mother had uh, Alzheimer's and I actually believe it was the husband or maybe the father. I'm horrible. I can't remember which, which person had the disease. I do believe it was the dad just because of this one thing the girl shared with me. Now, I have this joke that I tell sometimes that my dad and I were talking while he was sick with Alzheimer's disease. And I was telling him when he passes, I want a a code word. If I connect with the medium, I need a code word. I need some sort of code word to know that he is still with me. And so I was holding a tangerine and he said tangerine. And the joke goes on to say other things that you'll have to come out live to see the punchline for. And so This girl comes up to me after the show and she says, you know, my my death code word with my dad was tangerine. He he came home with tangerines one time, had this big old bag of tangerines and told my brother that he had tangerine power. And so tangerine was my code word with my dad. And I was like, wow, that really just stopped me in my tracks because one coincidence feels like a coincidence. Three, three things in one show felt like a message. It felt like a sign. And so I, I, I'm going to take it from a sign from beyond the grave of both Nancy and Joe, even though neither of them are in a grave. They're at home in my sister's urn garden because my sister has 45 urns from four different families for some fucking reason. Everyone keeps leaving urns at my sister's house. So if you have a family member who died who you don't care about, but you kind of love, but you want to know that they're okay, send them to Emily Jane DeMarco Peluso's house, Peluso DeMarco. Let her know that you are sending (laughs) a submission for her urn garden. Neither of them are coming to me from beyond the grave, but it felt like they were connected with me in that moment. And I was like, I have to keep going. I got to keep going and I have to keep doing this. You know, comedy can be hard, traveling can be hard, but it's such an amazing 
skill to have. It's a really cool skill set to have. You know, I only went to a little bit of college and it turns out that my loud mouth was something that now connects people in a really cool way. And I want to thank those people who shared with me afterwards. I thought that was really sweet. And Nancy and Joe forever. Nancy and Joe forever. Diddy do it. You guys, There's Diddy's still in the news. Diddy is in jail. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, we, we want the list of party goers, right? You think you're going to get a list of people at the party? We haven't seen Trump's taxes. He hasn't filed taxes ever. I've paid more taxes than Trump. You think we're going to get a list of the freak-offs? It's never going to happen. That's just a quick little update for you. America is what I'm calling the new scams that I keep getting. I get scammed left and right. Is anybody else getting scammed? Don't click on any link that you get from your email. Do not, I, I, do not recommend it because I did it and then I had to reset everything. I, I had to reset everything. Scamerica, scam America. Here's this one I got from the Chelsea Handler podcast. Hi, I'm Jason from Chelsea's team. Jason, just a random Jason. We'd love to have you on Chelsea's podcast. And here I am going, oh yeah, of course you would. I'm amazing. I know Chelsea. I saw her topless on a table once at a party. Your insights would add immense value to our discussions on fitness, fashion, lifestyle, music, personal stories, success journeys, entrepreneurship, and social issues. Look, the word immense value is not a word that anyone's using in an email about podcasts. It sounds like something a robot wrote. And then it said, we offer $3,000 for your participation and precipitation because I'm already sweating thinking about the scam that's happening to me. The interview is virtual. You can join from any device. Interested? Let me know. I responded. (laughs) Not me thinking it was real. (laughs) I figured it wasn't at this point, but I responded, said, hi, I can do it for 10K an episode. Do you want my Venmo? Do you think I heard back from them? No response. I thought, well, ding. It sounds like Chelsea Handler's struggling if she can't afford to give me 10 grand for my immense value. You guys are the ones who mentioned immense value. Don't come on trying to scam me because you're going to get scammed back. Q snooze. That's right. We got some new Q snooze. Well, it's not so new, but I was excited about this. Post Malone says the world's best Italian restaurant is in central New York. Now, it's not a restaurant that is in Syracuse. I believe it's a restaurant in Utica, New York. But Post Malone grew up in Baldwinsville and he actually went on, was interviewed by my friend Gomez Adams on TK99 in Syracuse. And so while in town, Post Malone made headlines when he stopped at Dinosaur Barbecue for pre-show BBQ. He told a local radio station, TK99, that he also got some Tully's famous chicken tenders and saw family members that still live in the area, including in Sandy Pond, Rochester, and Baldwinsville. When I come up, I make it a goal to try and see everybody, he said in an interview with host Gomez after his Syracuse concert. It's just a big family. I love that he loves the chicken tenders from Tully's. If you go to Syracuse, the Tully's chicken tenders, for some reason, are what you get. There's a chicken tender salad, and it's the most basic iceberg lettuce bagged bagged iceberg le- iceberg lettuce salad that you could ever get with chicken tenders on top and for some reason with ranch dressing it fills your soul you know he says he really wants to make a trip out to Canales and go eat there because it's my favorite italian restaurant in the world i would dare say better than olive garden see i'm like oh Canales, that's in Oswego, it's an Italian place. I think I've been there once or twice because we never really went out to Oswego. We told that's where all the drunks were. Meanwhile, everyone drinks and drives in Syracuse every damn day. But I love that he said, dare I say, better than Olive Garden because there goes all the, any sort of, uh, like, you know, me counting on him to have taste in, in Italian food. There goes it all right out the window. Maybe he's trying to be cute and funny. I just thought it was so sweet. My friend interviewed him and he said he was great. The restaurant said, we would love to have you come visit us soon. And Canales makes its own canned tomato sauce. So check it out. Check it out. He was in Syracuse. He had a show, I think. He's, he's fun. 
I, he's fun, you know? Uh, Malone told TK99 he's thinking about getting his own place in central New York. I was thinking about getting a spot out here just to spend some time, man. The air smells so good, and it's just a be- beautiful place to be. It really is beautiful, and the air really does smell good. There's something about the air. Maybe because where Post is and where I am, it, there's so many people. There's so many people everywhere, so it's completely polluted. When you go to places where it's not like that, you're like, oh, my God, I can breathe. Is this what air is like? This is amazing. Speaking of air and clean air, the highest mountain may not be what you think, right? What is the highest mountain on earth? Turns out the answer to that question is more debatable than you think. Now, this is an article that I was like, oh, this is interesting. I have a couple friends who like to hike and a couple friends. My bestie, Erin, has always dreamed of going on a hike. I think she's always wanted to hike the, not the Appalachian Trail, but I think, um, I know my friend Leo has done Machu Picchu in, in Peru. And I think Aaron has wanted to do the Alps. But this interview, I was like, oh, this is interesting. It, it's not what we thought it was. And I read this interview and at the end it says something completely crazy. So I had to read this. So just bear with me while I go through this. Uh, what is the highest mountain on earth? If you measure the altitude above sea level, then at 29 thousand 32 feet mount everest which straddles the border between tibet and nepal is clearly the world's highest yet if you measure a mountain from its base to its peak then the 33,500 foot mau mauna kia is an inactive shield volcano on the island of hawaii hawaii would instead come up on top but there is one more contender for highest mountain and that's snoop dog on a hill no kidding mount Chibarazo, an inactive stratovolcano in the Cordillera Occidental range of the Ecuadorian Andes. I'm sure a couple of those words did not come out of my mouth correctly. When measured from sea level, Chimborazo is about 8,500 feet shorter than Everest, yet its peak is actually 6,800 feet farther from the Earth's center, making it the closest point on Earth to the stars. Um, Van Westrom explains a planet is like many of its human inhabitants actually protrudes a bit around the waistline. Is that a dig at fat people in this article? That's are they trying to make a joke? So the earth protrudes around the waistline because of the spinning. Okay. So because of this mountain being close to the equator, it bulges out and that's what gives it its little edge over Mount Everest. The centrifugal force created by the planet's constant rotation squishes the rock and Chimborazo takes advantage of that squish to be further from the Earth's center than the mountainous than the mountain higher from sea level in the Himalaya or even the Andes which are located further from the equator. So this article goes on and on to describe and basically campaign for how great Chimborazo is. These days about 500 mountaineers attempt to summit each year according to Santiago Granada, the undersecretary promotion at Ecuador's Ministry of Tourism, right? This whole article sounds like an ad to climb. He says just over half of them make it to the top because of a range of factors including altitude, preparedness, and inclement weather. More and more people have started to climb and train and prepare for big challenges at Chimborazo. You're further away from the core of the earth and closer to the stars than you will ever be, ever be with your feet on this planet. And that's a big selling point. So this guy is basically trying to sell us on Chimborazo. You know, everyone's got something they're trying to sell. People are even trying to sell mountains out here. Can you imagine? Hey, I got a mountain for you. You think Everest is tall? Eh, no, no, come around back. It reminds me of Bob De Niro sending Henry Hill's wife down the alley to go get jackets when he's trying to kill her. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Those hoping to summit the mountain typically tackle it over two days as opposed to the roughly two months you need to climb Mount Everest. Of course, climbers are required to take a week of acclimatization activities in advance. The CEO of Quito based Active Expedition, Christian Valencia, leads the mountaineering trips to the summit, has said. This is starting to basically sound like an ad for. Ecuador. It's an Ecuadorian tourism ad. And that's fine. I'm here for that. But then it, it kind of takes a turn here. The mountain is a refuge for 8,000 rewildered vicuñas, a feral ancestor of domesticated alpacas and home to the world's largest hummingbirds, which filter around a flowering evergreen shrub called the Chicarigagua. 
There are also forests of gnarled quinoa, which survive at higher altitudes than any other tree. Another draw is the mountain's pre-Columbian history. Right? All that sounds great. Are you kidding me? Uh, ancestors of alpacas? I'm moving in. If you have an alpaca, I'm moving in. Chances are I'm never coming back home. If it spits at me, I'll find a reason that it was my fault. I'm moving in. They have h large hummingbirds? How big are we talking? Can I fly this sucker home? And, and amazing trees that hang higher than Snoop Dogg? I'm there. Then this is actually where the article takes a turn. Another draw is the mountain's pre-Columbian history. Cue scary music. Chimborazo was a site of ritualistic sacrifices of young women and children during the Incan times. Uh, uh full stop. Why didn't you start the article with that? So far, Chimborazo being tall is not its most interesting fact. What did you just say? The acts were thought to appease the gods and bring about a fertile harvest. To this day, local indig... In <laughs> Indig I can't why can't I speak today? Indigenous indin I know this word. <laughs> Local indigenous groups revere Tatya Chimborazo or Father Chimborazo as a powerful Apu or mountain god. Valencia, the guy from before who's the head of the tourism the Ministry of Tourism of Ecuador, says the mountain carries a deep importance for all Ecuadorians and even appearing on the mountains coat of arms the nation's coat of arms has the mountain on it it doesn't matter how many times i visit he says i still feel this strong energy every time i go uh you casually mention at the end of this article that you guys used to feed women and children to the mountain well, well no wonder it's so tall i'd be tall too i would be tall too if i ate ch women and children i'd be taller than everybody out here i'm sorry is that a draw did you just call ritualistic sacrifices of women and children a draw? Uh, yikes. Not visiting. Gonna not even leave one star on Yelp. It sounds like Tatya Chimborazu was just a hungry cannibal, not a powerful god. Why are we even acting like he's someone special in this time where women and ch children are suffering all over the world? We're going to act like this, uh, what do they call it? A powerful apu? Uh, powerful, no thank you. You're eating women and children and you think you're special because of it? I, I can't believe they just dropped this at the end of the article. I was like, you know what, man? I was all excited to go visit Chimborazo with its bulge. I'm like, oh, a mountain with a bulge? It's my soulmate. Are you kidding me? Not anymore. They're tossing in women and children like their afternoon snacks into this mountain. We'd all be tall, not going, canceling it, canceling, shutting it down, guys. Speaking of not going, the astronauts are not coming home anytime soon. I don't know if you guys have kept up with this, these astronauts that are stranded. I've talked about it a couple of times because it sounds like a total nightmare. Sunita Williams and Barry Wilmore, who has the same nickname as my dad, his nickname is Butch, and Sunita, her nickname is Sunny, I believe. They've been stranded at the ISS, International Space St Station, since June after their Boeing spacecraft suffered tr thruster fail uh, failures and issues amongst the spacecraft. The SpaceX rescue flight will not return until February. It arrived just after 10.30 p.m. in September, I believe around my dad's birthday is when it docked into the station. So they were only meant to stay in orbit for eight days. But because of the issues with everything, they're going to be there for basically over a year. They had issues with the Starliner's propulsion system, and that means that they're left stranded in space for months. It's going to end up being over a year. NASA confirmed in August that the two will not return to Earth until 2025. They were only supposed to be there for eight days. And I'm like, oh, God, this is insane. So I've been keeping up with it because of Butch talking about the signs from before. SpaceX is now in charge of rescuing the astronauts. They've already docked the Dragon flight, Crew Dragon, to the International Space Station with U.S.'s Nick Hogg and Russia's Alexander Gorbanov. They manned the capsule, which docked at the ISS uh, whatever time on that Sunday. I, I think it was September 30th. Boeing Starliner undocked from the ISS and flew back to Earth in September without the crew. 
NASA decided the thruster val- failures and helium leaks that uh, cropped up after liftoff were too serious and poorly understood to risk the pilot's test pilot's return. So the solution for them to get the stranded people out of space, correct me if I'm wrong, was to send two more people to space? <laughs> Sounds like space needs an Uber. Sounds like space needs a shuttle. So uh, let's bring more astronauts up in space. Uh, who's running things in ground control? Is everyone hotboxing ground control? They're just down there, like, like, like freaking dazed and confused. Just what are we gonna do? There's people stuck up there. Oh, send more people. Send more of them. That's like what happens when there's like a scary house. You just send people and go see what's in the house. You go look and come back and report. Well, they're not gonna come back. They're gonna die. I hope these people don't die. These amazing astronauts. Talk about heroes. These people who are willing to leave their family, leave their house. Okay, most of us just leave our house and go to work down the street, a couple miles down. A lot of us commute. People in LA make big commutes, driving a couple hours. These people leave their bed, leave their house, get to work, leave work, leave the Earth's atmosphere, and then enter outer space. No one else is making a greater freaking contribution to discovery than astronauts. One giant step for mankind outside of our freaking uh, uh, atmosphere, right outside of it, going outside of the ozone layer. Once you exit the ozone layer, you're a hero in my book. And you're stranded. So I hope they come home. I really hope they figure it out. And if SpaceX ends up Rescuing these people, I'm going to give Elon Musk's workers props because that is amazing, especially when Boeing, an established company, obviously a very established company, but is having severe issues and liability issues because of a lot of problems, making it very stressful for me to fly this season for my tour. SpaceX is going to show up like the young kid with the new technology. (sighs) Like, I got it. I'm going to bring these astronauts back home. So they're supposed to return in February 2025. I'm keeping up to date on this. You can actually watch NASA. There's a NASA app I have. You can watch the International Space Station live. You can see the crew. You can see what they're doing. You can see updates. They give you a whole bunch of facts. There's videos. If you're a nerd, check it out. Check out NASA's app, guys. It's great. (laughs) Oh, my God. Check it out. You're going to love it. Let's do an overheard before we get to some May Bay's mail. I overheard this, and I can't remember where it was. But out of context is what I want. If you don't know what overheards are, it's a sentence. One sentence, maybe two, that you hear walking by someone or in a grocery store, someone who you're not actively engaged in a conversation with. That's what makes the criteria for overheards. So if you want to submit them, submit them. You can email us at jessiemaypelusocomedy at gmail.com and I'll read them for the podcast. This overheard said, it ain't over until you vomit. Truer words have never been spoken. But I beg to differ because my friend Aaron, who I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, who just celebrated a birthday that I forgot about. Shout out to Aaron Birmingham, my girl who used to work overnight shifts for the head of Telemundo so that she could go to law school in the day. This girl was pulling 20 hour days, sleeping for two hours and doing it for three years. This girl is just one of the most amazing people I know on planet Earth. This girl, when we would go out, there's this one time and it happened a few times, but this one particular time, she, we were in a cab in between bars. Now, we used to go to open bar. You've never seen women consume alcohol like us in an open bar. We were there like f- horses coming back from a race, drinking out of a trough. And I don't know why. We thought we're going to get our money's worth, so we're going to slam these vanilla bourbon and Coca-Cola drinks right now. Actually, they had vanilla bourbon and cranberry. Don't ask. Was it good? <laughs> What do you think? It was free. Does something of those flavors that are free sound like they're going to be good for your palate? I think not. This isn't anything they're serving in a French restaurant. This was at the 4040 Club in New York. We're lucky we didn't pass by P. Diddy. I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be stuck in some freaking island. But anyways, 
We were in a cab once, leaving one open bar to go to another. This girl rolled down the window. She was in the front seat of the cab. Threw up. Luckily, my window was not down in the back seat. She threw up outside of the window. Rolled it back up and was GTG, baby. Good to go. She's like, where are we going next? I'm like, this Irish Mexican witch is over here slamming vanilla bourbon cranberries. Like, she's getting paid to do quality control. Vomiting them up to make room for whatever free beverage we were on our way to discover. And I love her in my heart for it. I love her in my heart for it. So I agree. It ain't over to you, to you vomit unless you're Aaron Birmingham. Then you're on to the next bar. That's a hero. That's an American hero. She could be an astronaut. She could be anything she wants. Let's do a little Maybay's mail. Maybay's mail. You can email me. Jesse May Peluso comedy at gmail.com. I'll read them on the pod. Love you so much. Gen X here, born 76. Hey, girl. Hey. I'm a millennial on the cusp. Girl, I know a mall way back. Hella Spencer Gifts. Yes. The last episode, I did a little reminiscing about the mall, the mall culture, and what it was like to hang out in a mall. I was a body shop girl. That's right. I asked all of you to send me your scents. She said she was a dewberry and Japanese oil musk. Ooh, fancy. Are you an artist? Body shop was my jam. Yankee Candle, tea and honey, discontinued. Damn shame. I've seen it on eBay for $500. Get your life. TCBY all day would get super high and hit the TCBY. Bath and Body Works, current scent, sweater weather, and blackberry basil. Those sound great. Don't get me in there when it's Halloween. Favorite holiday. Thank you for recognizing. And they have a buy three, get two. I'm about to get in my car and go to the mall today if this is a fact. I do serious damage. I drop two to three hundred easily and stock up on plugins, hand soap, mini hand sanitizers, bath joy, and mini scent sprays for a year. All the things. Ah, the champion sweatshirt with the white turtleneck underneath and the special fold in the jeans. You guys don't know what it was like to grow up with real style that all these people are trying to cop now. TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Walmart, Burlington, Ross, Five and Below, Marshalls, Arts and Crafts, Ikea. I'm only allowed in some of those quarterly and some of them once a year. I should probably be banned altogether, but I look at it as I'm keeping the store from folding. Same. I have no self-control. I don't leave with less than a $400 bill. I need a separate addiction sponsor alone for these stores. You bring me tons of joy. Tons and tons of joy. I have gratitude for Jesse May today. X-O-M-K. I think this is Michelle Klein. Thank you so much for your message. I appreciate you. We have another one from Chris Bath. Thank you from a fan. Hello, Celebrity Crush. I love your comedy, and I hope you make it in Denver in the near future. I also like when you were on the Adam Carolla podcast. Keep doing what you do. I look forward to more content. That's right. I like to go on Adam Carolla, and, and I like to poke the bear a little bit, because Adam is so serious sometimes. He's all political. I'm like, let's have some fun. You're a dad of two. I know you can be a silly goose. Your fans want to see you be a silly goose, so let's be a silly freaking goose. Let's do one more before I tell you what I found on my dog's freaking blanket, and then I'm going to let you leave. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to the mall. This is from Lauren, who DM'd me. She says, hi, Jesse May. I'm a huge fan, and I just wanted to leave you a message, finally, after years of following your comedy. Now, this is a message I found that I missed after my mom passed away. I got so many messages from people, and I didn't get to all of them. So I found this message from her, and then she left me a more recent one. And when I found the recent message, I found this one. Anyways, she says, I'm from Syracuse where you grew up and went to city schools. I remember you being a few years older than me and seeing you either at Lincoln or Henniger. <laughs> yeah. So dorky, but I thought you were so pretty and cool. Oh, my gosh, girl. I have followed your work for a long time and love your podcast. You are such a great person. Somehow I feel as if I know you because we are from the same hometown. And I once saw you or twice. LOL, BFFs. I feel like maybe your mom was on a PTA committee or something. Yes, she was. She was the head of the teachers, the non-teachers section of the PTA, the Syracuse um, local union for the schools. She represented everybody in a school that wasn't a teacher, like the lunch ladies and the bus drivers and the aides and all of that. I feel like maybe your mom was on a committee or something because I just remember knowing who your mom was. And somehow when you posted the podcast with her. I'm very sorry for the loss of your parents. I lost my parents as well. I love your wisdom and humor, and I just wanted to finally say hello to a fe fellow Syracuse gal, and congrats on all your success. And then she sent a message recently. 
Your recent episode had me all in the fields of Syracuse, and we had the same fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Fisher. When you were talking about the Harlem Globetrot- Globetrotters, I was like, yes, love your vibe, love your work, wishing you the best. That's the teacher I couldn't think of last week when I was talking about freaking Hugo. Was that his name? Lauren, the mascot for the Charlotte Hornets, the team we never saw. We never went to a game, yet we supported them. Where is that love? I miss that love. Thank you so much for sending me a message and connecting with me and feeling connected with me through Syracuse. It is my hometown. I know a lot of people like to talk crap about their hometowns. I'm proud of where I come from. And so was Post Malone, even though we never hung out. Posty, I wonder if him and I ran into each other and just didn't know it. So speaking of running into things, something ran into my dog's blanket. And I posted this on my Instagram story, and I had to post it here because it was so terrifying. I brought my dogs over to my guy's house, and I put the blanket down for the dogs, and there was a gigantic monster on it, huge monster, just in time for Halloween, a whole ass wolf spider. And I, and, and I looked at it, and I'm such a nerd. I don't know why these facts are in my head. I go, oh my God, that's a wolf spider. And my, and my man's like, no, 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 it's not a wolf spider. I'm like, what do you know, David Attenborough? You don't watch these shows like I do. It's a wolf spider. Sure enough, I Googled it. Freaking wolf spider. Turns out they're relatively harmless. I love when people say that about something that looks like this. You know, you guys call people who are just walking home, you classify them as looking dangerous. This thing looks dangerous. Not someone in a hoodie. This thing is actually dangerous. You you put this thing in a hoodie and I'm I'm gone. Spiders look like they just go inside of your body and absorb your all of you and then wear you like skin. I asked everybody if I should throw my car out because it was I oh God I'm I'm just thinking like there's spiders on me now. If I should throw my car out because the spider was in the car. Everyone said yes, so that is what I'm planning on, is throwing the car out. One of my fans sent me a message. James said, here's an idea. Feed the spider, gain its trust, then kill it. Or maybe that could backfire and he tells his friends and you feed them and more show up. Proceed at your own risk. Either way, I'm screwed. And I I regret to say that my man did kill the spider. The spider is no longer with us. The spider is gone. Migrate or die. That spider had to die. I wish I would have let it migrate because now I know that it's not so dangerous, but there's enough spiders, right? We're good. (laughs) But if we all keep killing them, is that bad? Is it like the bees? Like if we don't have spiders, something's not getting food. And then that thing's not gonna be able to be nourished and then that thing's gonna die, whatever that thing feeds. (sighs) Guys, there's too much going on. We just have to celebrate Halloween, keep our heads down and migrate or die. That's what it comes down to in life. You got to keep moving or you're going to die. You see a spider, you keep moving. You know, you have to just keep trekking on. Don't sit still for too long because a spider will think you're its new home. Or worse, you're you're its new snack. No one wants to be a snack for a spider. So migrate or die. Don't see the new Salem's Lot movie. Read the book. What else did I want to tell you? I want to tell you that I love you and thank you for listening and I appreciate you so much. Thank you for coming back every week and for sharing my podcast. You guys are amazing. I really appreciate it. Bye.